You did what? Come on out. We'll be right back. If you can say those three lines, you're a talk show host. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 craziest things you didn't know about Jerry Springer. I am the father of the destruction of Western civilization. I have done that. For this list, we're looking at lesser known facts about this notorious yet undeniably legendary talk show host who sadly passed away in April 2023. What memories still have you chanting, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Fleeing London and Immigrating to the U.S. Although parts of Springer's life sound like something out of a surreal comedy, his early life was full of tragedy and hardships. His Jewish parents, Margot and Richard Springer, fled from Nazi Germany to London in 1939, about a month before World War II commenced. Their daughter Evelyn would be born in 1940. About a year and a half before the war ended, Gerald Jerry Norman Springer was born in the Highgate tube station, which served as a bomb shelter. Several of his family members sadly died during the Holocaust, including his maternal grandmother, paternal grandmother, and great uncle. As Jerry's fifth birthday approached, the Springer family decided to immigrate to New York, where they laid down roots in a Queens neighborhood, pursuing the American dream. He had a confidence in his sense of humor. Uh, he had a confidence about doing silly things. Number nine, his unscripted spy who shagged me contribution. Springer made numerous cameos, although his appearance in the Austin Powers sequel is perhaps the funniest. If you just joined us, today's topic is my father is evil and he wants to take over the world. This hilarious scene almost went in a few different directions. Okay, let's bring out Scott's father, Dr. Evil. In an early script, Springer asked Dr. Evil to share something about himself, prompting the villain to go on a disturbing rant. Part of this tirade made it into a deleted scene. I'm the Princess of Canada. Yeah. Although I can't officially back that up with paperwork. While the ensuing fight was in the script, Springer himself initially wasn't part of it. As they were shooting, the filmmakers asked Springer if there was anything he'd like to try. Since Springer hadn't been in a fight before, he thought it'd be funny if Dr. Evil came after him. With about 20 minutes left to shoot, Springer found himself on the ground biting Dr. Evil's leg. Number 8. Jerry Springer, The Opera. You can't be rushing up on stage attacking our guests. You know better than that. You might have heard that The Jerry Springer Show inspired a 1998 film entitled Ringmaster. But did you know that the tabloid talk series also provided the basis for a British musical? Jerry Springer, The Opera maintains the trashy spirit of the show, with the host interviewing eyebrow raising guests. <laughs> However, the plot takes some strangely supernatural turns as Springer fights with his inner Valkyrie, goes to hell, and moderates a confrontation between Jesus and Satan. If you want to achieve anything here, you and your people are going to have to work with me on this. Jesse the cards. Throw in some tap dancing KKK members, and you can see why this musical received at least 55,000 complaints after a 2005 TV broadcast. While appropriately controversial, the stage show still ran for more than 600 performances in London and even had an off-Broadway run in 2018. Number 7. His presence motivated two anchors to quit By 1997, Springer's edgy show had already been on the air for about six years. Yet the popular host still found the time to serve as a 10 p.m. news commentator for WMAQ-TV, much to the dismay of two anchors. Carol Marine had been with the NBC affiliate for nearly two decades, but Springer's arrival led her to resign. Marine harshly called Springer, quote, the poster child for the worst television has to offer. How could you do this to me on national television? Comments like this hurt Springer, who felt Marine was, quote, tremendously rude to him. But one of the anchors said she was deeply offended, that I wasn't up to her standards, that because of the admittedly wild and crazy talk show I do, I would taint everyone who worked here. Marine's co-anchor Ron Majors also left in response to Springer's hiring. In the end, Marine went to CBS News, Majors signed up with the ABC-owned WLS, and Springer only delivered two commentaries at WMAQ before leaving. This elitist snobbery that only people who read an anchor's approval should be permitted to share the set is now being hidden in the self-righteous cries of journalistic integrity. 
bowl and you can fill in the rest of that word. Number six, legitimacy of guests and brawls. Jerry Springer launched numerous debates, although one in particular loomed over the show. Are the fights real or staged? I knew going in every day they were going to hand me a circus, so I couldn't pretend to be upset about it. While some have a hard time believing every guest was legit, the producers did take measures to book people with truly outrageous stories. Betrayed by my parrot, real or fake? That was real. Journalist Harmon Leon devised a phony story in hopes of getting on the show. He went through several hoops with a booking agent who ultimately stopped returning his calls. Springer himself claimed that his guests and the situations were genuine, although he admitted that the reactions could be, quote, embellished. Guests were often motivated to fight with each other, and the producers would even get them fired up before taping. Both real and fake, you can see why Springer was compared to WWE. It's, it's an, an hour of escapism. But at least our show is reality. What we call reality shows today, it really isn't reality. Number five, I married a horse backlash. As politicians like William Bennett and Joseph Lieberman pleaded with broadcasters to take Jerry Springer off the air, the show released arguably its most shocking episode. But before we talk to Mark, let's meet his wife. Please welcome her to the show, Mark Twain. <laughs> Debuting in 1998, even Springer was unprepared when guest Mark Matthews introduced his wife of five years, a pony named Pixel. Initially, Springer assumed that Matthews had a human wife who fell off the horse. Are you putting it together at this point? No! <laughs> I'm thinking that his wife fell off the horse. <laughs> While Springer was already infamous, this episode was the straw that broke the horse's back for some. I'm gonna vomit. <laughs> Numerous stations, including WLWT, where Springer had anchored, would not allow the episode on their airwaves. Springer seemed to peak in notoriety with I Married a Horse. I look at the next name on the list and it says Pixel. Well, <laughs> let's bring out Pixel. <laughs> and out comes this horse. Bernard Goldberg even singled out the horse incident when he wrote about Springer in 100 People Who Are Screwing Up America. Number four, love, death, and trash TV. While the horse episode might have been more shocking, 2000's Secret Mistresses Confronted had the most fatal aftermath. In the episode, Eleanor and Ralph Panitz confronted the latter's ex-wife Nancy Campbell, who walked off stage during the taping. Only a few hours following the episode's July 24th airing, Nancy was found dead in her Sarasota home, which she had previously shared with Ralph and Eleanor. The couple was linked to the crime scene, although only Ralph was tried. Backed by strong DNA evidence, Ralph was found guilty of second-degree murder. Nancy's son Jeffrey also pursued legal action against The Springer Show. Although lawyers believed Nancy's family could receive $25 million in damages, they settled for zero following a similar case with The Jenny Jones Show. Number 3. Springer Was In On The Joke Audiences either loved or hated The Springer Show, although major publications generally included it on worst-of lists rather than best-of. It even topped TV Guide's worst shows of all time in 2002. Some might take offense to this, but Springer embraced his title as the grandfather of trash TV, saying it was, quote, probably accurate. I am the father of the destruction of Western civilization. I have done that. At the same time, he found the term trash TV to be a, quote, elitist criticism. Springer thought of his guests as, quote, regular people involved in crazy situations. That said, Springer openly admitted that his show was, quote, stupid. No, my show is plain stupid. I mean, it's just... <laughs> he didn't even watch it, but Springer understood why people tuned in. It was a circus of escapism, and Springer was proud to be its ringmaster. It was, it really was an escapism for me. You know, whatever's going on in my life, I could go into that show and have a laugh. Number two, the fight that changed everything. Springer might have been synonymous with trash TV, but the show didn't start like that. When it premiered in 1991, the show attempted to mimic Phil Donahue's style, and the topics were more political. Uh, every night on our newscast, we've got stories about the crime and the great problems in, in our inner cities. The show as we know it wouldn't form its identity until a couple of years in. During an episode tackling racism, an unplanned brawl broke out among the guests. One more time, I you will have... No. As tensions cooled down, Springer condemned the violence that had taken place. 
but let's try and do it without hitting each other, okay? While Springer thought this was the beginning of the end, creator Burt Dubrow saw the potential for ratings to grow, and producer Richard Dominic continued to push the show in this direction. To head up the show's security, they hired Steve Wilkos, who assumed this would be a, quote, one-time gig. Before we unveil our top pick, here are some honorable mentions. Why he dressed as a Yankee at school. Others made fun of his wardrobe until he traded in a bow tie for a baseball uniform. His mother bought him a Yankees uniform to wear to school, and he wore this Yankees uniform, and all the kids liked him all of a sudden. Defeating Oprah in the ratings. It was the first talk show to do so in years. By early spring of 1998, he was beating daytime queen Oprah Winfrey claiming the number one spot for 25 weeks in a row. Oh! You think Oprah can do this? He served in the Army. The anti-war Springer was discharged after a brief stint at Fort Knox. And the day after announcing for Congress, he was called to active duty. On November 28, 1969, he reported for basic training at Fort Knox, where his sense of humor quickly made enemies out of the drill sergeants. Becoming a political commentator and news anchor. He'd win 10 local Emmys, although his talk show was never nominated. So, as I thank you tonight for the best anchor honor, as well as for accepting me in this dual role, I also must thank my bosses. First, because they deserve it. Second, because they may be watching. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Springer, the Politician While he'll be best remembered as a TV personality, Springer had a lengthy political career, starting as Robert F. Kennedy's campaign advisor. Springer landed at a law firm after Kennedy's assassination, but he had political aspirations. A year after a failed Congress run, Springer found himself serving on the Cincinnati City Council. Springer resigned amid a scandal involving sex workers, but he won his seat back the following year. He even spent a year as Cincinnati's mayor. If government, any government, is to have any positive effect on our lives, which after all is its purpose, to make life more tolerable, then that government must bear some relationship to how we live. In the early 80s, Springer set his sights on becoming Ohio's governor, although he couldn't attain the Democratic nomination, finishing third. Over the years, Springer considered running for other offices. This never materialized, but Springer was arguably more qualified than a lot of people who've made it further in politics. I run because it has become increasingly evident that unless some new alternative, some new initiative, some new approach is injected into the political life of our community, we are destined to lose here at home the very prize we seek to defend abroad. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.